Good afternoon, and welcome to the Thursday, May 9, 2019 work session of the Interactive County Public School Board. Uh, members of the board, you've seen the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and second. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The next item of the first item on the agenda is to uh, convene a closed meeting for discussion of matters covered under items A1, A2, and A8 of section 2.2-3711 of the Code of Virginia 1950 as amended, pertaining to the following, the assignment, appointment, performance, disciplining, and re release of contract for specific employees, the admission and discipline of specific students, including a request for religious exemption from compulsory education, in consultation with legal counsel regarding specific legal, legal matters regarding requiring the provision of legal advice related to an employee contract. Is there a motion that we go into closed session for those purposes? So moved. It's been uh, moved by Mr. Cox. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Pike. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed ayes have it. We'll now move to closed session. Thank you. Uh, is there a motion to certify that only those matters identified in the motion moot that uh, uh, took us into closed session were discussed pursuant to the statute? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Seconded second. by Dr. Cooper. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. Uh, Madam Superintendent. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman. For the first item, the superintendent recommends that the school board approve the readmission of student case number 17-18-S-10, and the name of the student is protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Thank you. Members of the board, is there a motion regarding the superintendent's recommendation for readmission of student identified by case number 17-18-S-10? Moved by Mr. Pike, is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, the superintendent recommends that the school board approve the request for release from compulsory attendance for student case number 18-19-RE-10 based on bona fide religious beliefs. And as always, names of students are protected under the Virginia Freedom of Information Act. Thank you. Members of the board, is there a motion regarding the recommendation from the superintendent for release of the compulsory education for student case number 18-19-RE-10. So moved. Moved, excuse me, moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Ogburn. All those in favor and keep us saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, I'm asking for the board's consideration to approve the appointment of administrative personnel for the 1920 school year. Thank you, members of the board. Is there a motion regarding the superintendent's recommendation for approval of administrative appointments? So moved. Moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The appointments are approved. Thank you. And the board has just approved the following administrative appointments. Rebecca Roper, Principal, Ridge Elementary School. Kevin Schatz, Principal, Colonial Trail Elementary School. John Marshall, Principal, Freeman High School. Charlie Goad, Assistant Principal, Longdale Elementary School. Leanna Moss Everhart, Associate Principal, Verina Elementary School. Stephanie Hoppin, Associate Principal, Moody Middle School. Sherry Gempel, Educational Specialist, Policy and Constituent Services. William Caton, Educational Specialist, School Quality and School Improvement. And Leslie Trailer, Compliance Specialist, Human Resources. All right, and we'll you. get to meet those individuals at our monthly meeting um, this month. And I know there's a lot of uh, excitement across the division as we, at this time of year, as we make those adjustments and changes and bringing people into new positions yes. and, uh, and bringing people into new positions and opens up additional positions. So we'll hear more from you That's right. in the coming weeks. Exciting so. time of the year. We're yes. excited to have all those individuals <clears throat> coming on board. Next, the superintendent recommends that the school board adopt the previously approved fiscal year 1920 annual financial plan with some amendments. And Debbie Hargrove is here to provide an overview of those amendments as we seek your approval. Debbie? Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. 
Um, I'm just going to briefly go over the changes from your previously approved budget. Next. Oh, I can do that. I didn't know if you were doing it. Sorry. Okay. Um, okay. Reduction of the funds for consolidation in the internal audit department. You were aware that we um, removed one. We moved one of our internal auditors, not the director or the um, clerical staff, but we moved one of our um, the one and only auditor over to the county. And the cost for this, the salary and benefits for that position was ninety five nine ninety two. Um, the, the Board of Supervisors provided a pay increase for all employees, um, and these are all employees that are hired before April 30th. Employees hired after April 30th will not receive the extra 3%. The um, increase of the million dollars for the grants and the 300000 for school nutrition also is just to cover their salary increase. The general fund 3% pay increase cost a total of $12 million. The Board of Supervisors provided $9 million less the $95,992. So we, our target went up um, $8.9 million, roughly. And um, they, did, they gave us an, an additional million for meals tax. Um, so anyway, so that was part of it. Our budget with the, the target increase of 8.9 million minus the million for meals tax, so the general fund um, non-county side went up the um, 7.9 million, okay? This all together took our total budget um, for all funds and in a total increase of 34 million, and that is from our current year's approved budget. I think this chart is a little confusing myself, but anyway, I didn't create it. The school board approved is the second column, but the change is from the adopted to adopted, okay? So um, our budget is going up. The largest increase since 2008-9, um, it's going up the general fund by 6%. Back in 8-9, it went up 6.9%. So... And this is just the pie chart to reflect the same numbers. Um, no real changes on that. Um, I think it was just a, a very minor percent change between instruction and um, administration. Instruction increased slightly. Um, same with the revenues. As you can see here, 5% um, of our funds are coming from the state. Um, 13.8, it will be the county transfer, the increase of the million on the meals tax, so the increase of the 29 million. Okay, and then there's just the breakdown of the um, revenue pie chart. 54% of our funds are coming from the state, where 43 is from county and 1.9, almost 2% in meals tax. So I guess you could essentially say 45% is coming from the county. Okay. Any questions? Any questions, board members? No. So, so the meals tax revenue, what it, it, the additional, is that an operational addition? That is revenue? operational. So the, what, what is our total meal tax operational? Dollar I think tax? it was, um, it's 10 million. Okay. So yes, it went sir. from nine to 10. Nine, nine to 10. To yes, 10. sir. Okay, good. Right. And I believe 9 million is still staying in the capital. And then the extra is for additional projects. Right. Yeah. All right, good. Thank you. That, and I would note that's the first increase in the operational yes, sir, portion it of is. those funds, so that's good. Mm -hmm. uh, anyone have any questions, comments, concerns, suggestions? No. Well, if there's not, then is there a motion regarding the financial plan? Mr. Chairman? Yes, Mrs. Cox. I move that we adopt the superintendent's recommend, uh, recommended budget. Um, Previously approved um, F1 2019-2020 annual financial plan with amendments including a salary increase for school board members who assume office in January of 2020. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. All right. It's been moved by Mrs. Cock and seconded by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Ayes have it. The motion carries. We have a plan. Yay. Yay. All right. Thank you. Just go execute. Thank you.
Thank you. For the next <coughs> item, staff is prepared to provide um, an overview of class scheduling, particularly at the secondary level, high schools. And so Dr. Farrell is here, joined by Lee Donovan and Andrew May, um, to provide that overview for you this evening. <coughs> Good afternoon, Chairman Montgomery, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, colleagues and guests. I have with me Freeman Principal Mr. Andrew May and Godwin Principal Mrs. Lee Donovan. We're here this afternoon to provide you with an update on class scheduling, particularly as it relates to Douglas Freeman and Mills Godwin moving to a block schedule. Each year, school leaders across the country reflect on their work and collaborate with colleagues to consider how to more effectively create conditions that support meaningful learning experiences and access to more opportunities for students. In addition, school leaders also work to create conditions that allow time for our teachers to collaborate and plan for the type of learning we expect to see in our classrooms, which will be reflected in our presentation as we highlight the Henrico Learner Profile. Before I turn the presentation over to Mr. May and Mrs. Donovan, I'd like to summarize for you briefly the information we plan to share with you. We will begin with a brief reflection of the Henrico Learner Profile, which is the what as it relates to teaching and learning in Henrico County, and the deeper learning model, which is how we bring the Henrico Learner Profile to life. As we build off of what it means to truly prepare students to be life ready, we will, we will articulate the positive impact of moving to a block schedule for students and teachers, and we will also share some of the challenges and concerns our principals have as it relates to the current seven period schedule. You will hear this afternoon about the impact of a block schedule in relation to a student's transition from middle school to high school and from high school to college into the workforce. Our principals will reflect on how the seeds have been planted prior to this school year as a move to a block schedule for Freeman and Godwin is not a new conversation. They will also share feedback received from staff as it relates to a change to a block schedule. That feedback is one of the main drivers for why this move needs to take place at the start of the 1920 school year. Most of the Freeman and Godwin teachers are ready. And for those who are not, we will address their needs through supports the teachers themselves have identified. Our principals have worked with their teachers, specialists, and coaches to develop professional learning plans to support, to, excuse me, to support all Freeman and Godwin teachers through the transition to a block schedule. Principals May and Donovan will also discuss plans to support students through the transition. And finally, Mr. May and Mrs. Donovan will share a communication plan to make their communities aware of a schedule change. Without further ado, I now turn the presentation over to Principal May and Principal Donovan. Thank you, Dr. Farrell, Mr. Montgomery, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell, good afternoon. We would like for you to reflect with us on our Henrico Learner Profile. On the front page, you will see our visual representation that starts with our students. The silhouette in the middle intentionally represents our learners from pre-K to 12. The next layer defines the attributes and the skills that all of our learners need to be life ready. Those attributes and skills are critical thinker, quality character, global citizenship, communicator, and collaborator. The outer band represents the deeper learning model, and it, it is what we will use to create those learning conditions. The next slide illustrates the four pillars of deeper learning in action. As you can see, students are actively engaged in the learning process. In the next, next set of slides, we would like to take a few minutes to highlight each of the four pillars as ways for this presentation to support block scheduling in all our high schools. Learning is anytime and anywhere. We encourage students to not only learn in the classroom, but to also utilize all areas of our building to learn. We also encourage students to extend their learning into their homes and into their communities. It is our responsibility as educators to ensure that everyday learning is authentic and connected, that it creates conditions that allow students to ask meaningful and thought-provoking questions, 
to explore solutions and important problems and to become, become contributors within their, within their communities and our society. Students are more engaged when they're allowed to be involved as, when they're allowed, to, students are more engaged when they're allowed to be agents of their own learning. This includes goal setting, monitoring, and reflecting on their own progress and achievements. Finally, learning should be community supported. It is critical for our students to understand and be able to, make, be able to connect learning to their local, state, and national and global communities. By connecting their learning beyond the classroom, our students become critical thinkers who are able to solve complex problems. How do we create, how do we further create the conditions necessary to bring the Henrico, the Henrico learner profile and the deeper learning model to life for our students? I believe that we, we begin by giving our students more time to explore, to investigate, to challenge their thinking and to ask questions and answer meaning to ask to ask questions and, and ask meaningful questions. As we prepare to embrace the Henrico Learner Profile and work to ensure that every one of our graduates leaves our schools with the critical soft skills necessary to be life ready, we must ask ourselves: Does our current Bell schedule support our students? Does it make the best use of instructional time? Does it support meaningful learning experiences that promote collaboration, critical thinking, communication, and character? Does it promote engaging, connecting, connected learning with, with real world outcomes? Does it allow for ample teacher planning and collaboration? Does it support our students with disability and our language, English language learners? Does it make the best use of our staffing allotments? If the answer to any of these questions is no, then we owe it to our students and our, our communities to carefully re-examine what it is that we do for our students. Both Ms. Donovan and myself believe the time is now to move our schools in a direction that will better support our, uh, better support our students. In arriving at this decision, we have to ask ourselves and our teams what is really best for our kids. As a result, today we believe that the, bell, the seven bell schedule not only adds to the challenge uh, not only as to the challenge of transition to high school. We believe that the stress and the pressure brought on by the rapid pace of the seven bell schedule are both unhealthy and unnecessary. In the highly competitive world of college enrollment, we believe that Freeman and Godwin students have the difficult task of having to prepare, to prepare for as many as five and six homework assignments, class projects, quizzes, and tests. Some of my parents have argued that this has presented our students with the unfair advantage uh, as they apply for college admission. We believe that the fast-paced nature of the 47-minute schedule can be an obstacle for struggling students and can lead to disengagement, greater retention rates, and dropout, dropout rates. We believe that the daily seven-class seven schedule not only limits opportunities for our vocational students, but in fact disservices them by forcing them to either arrive late or leave midway through their academic classes to catch buses bound for the tech centers. We believe that now is the time to give our students access to a comprehensive, innovating learning experience every day. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell, thank you for having us today. Students who attend feeder middle schools in the Freeman and Godwin zones are on a block schedule. In going to block schedules at our school, the, trans the transition for students would be seamless. Freeman and Godwin have high percentages of students who attend two and four year colleges after graduation. A block schedule will also provide students with an opportunity to prepare for a schedule that resembles what they will experience at the college level. The additional time in a block schedule class will allow for teachers to go beyond the content and to truly incorporate the six C's and the soft skills necessary for our students to be successful in their chosen profession. Employers are looking for young people who not only have the skills to complete a task, they are looking for young people who are creative thinkers and who are able to work in teams to solve complex problems. The block schedule will allow for our students to have the time to engage with content embedded in the six C's in order to prepare to join the workforce and experience success. 
In addition to preparing students to be college ready, the move to a block schedule also supports the needs of our students who plan to join the workforce immediately after graduating. What should a life ready lesson look like at the high school level? On a block schedule, students are engaged in a variety of activities throughout the class period. There is less of a lecture style and more discussion in the classroom. Students will have time for inquiry, workshop, application of knowledge, and project-based learning. There is time for teachers to conduct formative assessment of student understanding. And there is time for student reflection on the lessons that they're learning. Discussions about block scheduling are not new to Godwin and Freeman. We have used block scheduling models at different times during the school year to allow more time in classrooms for testing or other special programs. Our staffs want to provide what is best for our students. We believe that block scheduling will lead us on the path to what is best for students using the Henrico Learner Profile as our North Star. To begin this path, we want to support our teachers who support our students. Both Freeman and Godwin conducted faculty needs assessments asking teachers what professional learning they might need in order to make a successful transition to block scheduling. As you can see, 57% of Godwin teachers have experience teaching on a block schedule. 71% of Freeman teachers have experience teaching on a block schedule. We also wanted to gain a perspective on our staff's comfort level as it relates to a move to block schedule. 88% of the Godwin teachers are moderately comfortable to completely comfortable with teaching on a block schedule. 87% of Freeman teachers are moderately comfortable to completely comfortable with teaching on a block schedule. How will we support our teachers through this change? Uh, this month, we have provided opportunities for our teachers to observe master teachers at schools on the block schedule for half days. We've also provided before, during, and after school teacher professional learning communities facilitated by librarians, innovative learning coaches, and the Department of Professional Learning and Leadership. We've also provided individualized lesson planning coaching from school and central office staff should teachers choose. And this is the most exciting part, I think, for Mr. May and me. Both Freeman and Godwin math departments will be working with the math specialist on math workshop concepts that will be aligned with deeper learning and the Henrico Learner Profile. These math workshop concepts will also be good preparation for Godwin and Freeman math teachers to work on a block schedule. This summer, we will continue with our support for teachers in June, July, and August by providing opportunities for them to again work in teacher professional learning communities facilitated by school and central office staff. We will also provide opportunities for teachers to participate in book studies and discussion alignment with theory on block scheduling. And then the support will not end into next year. September, uh, we will start with monthly professional learning opportunities dedicated to collaborative lesson planning uh, to provide deeper learning opportunities for students aligned with the Henrico Learner pro Profile on the block schedule. How will we support our students? We will support students through this transition by providing digital postings of assignments on Schoology and other places. We will provide them with a variety of activities in the classroom. A better scheduling environment will be in place for our ACE Center students, as Mr. May commented on earlier. We will continue with a directed study time included in the Bell schedule. We will have a unified testing schedule so that students have the opportunity to show their best work on tests, not all in one day. Students will have access to their school counselors. 
and the block schedule lends itself naturally to providing for more time for homework and studying in between classes because of the alternating days. We would like to move forward with our communication plan for our communities. Mr. May and I were very unified in our message communicating the plan to move to block schedule to our faculties, giving them time to express concerns and tell us what they needed for the transition. We will use School Messenger to communicate with our families about block scheduling plans for next school year, outline the schedules for 1920 school year and providing plans for addressing concerns that families may have. The biggest question that Mr. May and I anticipate from our families is, what does this mean for my students' individual schedule for next year? We are ready to help our families with their concerns in any way needed. We would like to communicate the changes as soon as possible so that we can begin the transition with our communities to a block schedule for the 2019 2020 school year. We thank you for the opportunity today to speak with you about this exciting opportunity for our schools. We're happy to entertain any questions at this time. Thank you very much. Members of the board, are there questions for the presenters? Mr. Pike, it looks like you may be about to ask a question. Do you have one? Okay, thank you. Anyone else while he's getting, are you, he's ready. All right. Um, you know, to me, it's, it's a no-brainer to, to go to a block schedule uh, because the middle schools that feed into you are on a block schedule and the other high schools that are in Henrico County uh, are already on a block schedule. Um, I, I just uh, I, I, I wonder uh, how this has been communicated to your communities. I've received any number of comments from parents early on and some staff members uh, that were adamantly opposed to going to a block schedule. Uh, they uh, find a level of comfort with the traditional schedule. Um, but I also recently have received any number of email comments from um, parents uh, and teachers uh, who are in favor of it. They believe absolutely that it's the way to go and they have would list any number of reasons as to why. Um, I think a lot of times in situations like this, um, uh, listening is really, really important. And, it, and if we haven't given people the opportunity to have input and, and, and we haven't listened to them, um, then I wonder how that uh, plays out as you work to implement um, a plan like this. Um, you know, I'm going to take a step back and think this uh, algebra plan that we had middle schools uh, looked like a great plan, great plan, great plan, great plan, and then we started hearing from parents how, how that was impacting their plans for their sons, daughters, moving forward into the summer, into the next school year, and all those kind of things. So we had to do some adjustment. I, I guess my concern is, uh, are we moving too quick? Uh, you know, I, I, I hear the terminology, well, let's just go ahead and rip the Band-Aid off and go and run. Uh, well, that, that's good, but uh, how, where are the roadblocks? Where, where are the things that uh, uh, we're going to bump into that are going to wreak havoc and cause problems? And, um, you know, uh, how, how are you going to assure that you're going to get training, proper training for faculty and staff? I mean, here we are in May. Uh, families have made plans for the summer. How do you, how do you know you're going to be able to pull people together and, and get that training and get that expertise? Um, like I said, I, I'm all for it. I, I think it makes sense, but I worry about the implementation of it. Um, and, you know, it's, it's a tough decision. Uh, I mean, if you're poised to do it and you delay a year, um, I don't know if that helps you or hurts you. Um, but I, I, I think uh, I would 
not want to jump into it and it not be done with quality and with all the details thought out and uh, making sure that everything's implemented in the right way. Uh, we talk a lot about stress in schools and in school systems. Um, that person who's absolutely comfortable with a seven period day, what kind of stress does that create in that switch? How do you, how do you work through those kind of things? Um, because parents are going to see it both ways, students are going to see it both ways, teachers are going to see it both ways. Um, you know, I, I think in this presentation, I, I would like to hear more of the nuts and bolts in terms of the pros and cons that really show why this is really the right thing to do, aside from the fact that our middle schools are already on it and the other five high schools are already on it. Why is this really the way to go? Uh, uh, is 90-minute block the way to go? I, I, you know, I don't know. Um, so, like I said, I'm not opposed. I just w wonder if this is too quick. That, that's my concern. Um, Thank you, Mr. Pike. Yeah. Uh, Madam Superintendent, perhaps they can, you or they can address that. So. Address it or, you know, I would certainly say as the um, principals have worked through this um, decision making process, I know that they um, have conveyed some in this presentation and, and also to staff supporting them the desire to make sure that they're providing opportunities to listen along the way. And so um, I know that's happened in a number of ways in your buildings and you can certainly share that. But I hear you and I know they hear you as well as uh, when it comes to thinking about implementation. So um, while certainly as building leaders, you know, we put our um, trust in them to make decisions for their buildings related to scheduling and programming and those sorts of things that best meet the needs for their students. And I think they've um, conveyed this evening uh, why it is that they've landed where they've landed um, and, and that they've weighed input on both sides of this. But perhaps um, you could you know, convey a bit to the board in, in response to that question in relation to um, you know, where you do anticipate some roadblocks or hiccups and what you're doing as far as implementation and continued communication um, to not only your staff but the communities now that um, you've made this decision uh, based on the input that you've received. If, if, um, if I could say, given the recent changes in the um, accreditation standards, um, from Freeman's perspective, there is a, a real move, need for us to move quickly. Um, I've thought about the time question, and given the response from my staff, and, and I hope I speak for Ms. Donovan too, um, there is a level of comfort. Um, among the things that we did in, in asking for teacher input as we made the decision was to ask for specific comments. And, and there, is, there is a lot of, um, um, well, fear is not the right word to use. There is that concern. Are, are we doing those things? But I think, by and large, there is a sense in, in the Freeman uh, staff that now is the time. Let's do it. I don't think we'll be any different, in any more different a place today than we would be um, you know, several weeks, months down the road. We've had these discussions. Um, we've always known or at least thought about moving to block. So I, I guess my feelings are that the staff is ready. The staff have thought through the concerns. They've asked us for very, very specific um, uh, um, needs, uh, resources, specific to lesson planning. Uh, I believe that, and you know, quoting one of our staff, I think we, we, we're thinking too much about this. Let's plow ahead. Uh, at the end of the day, I think that we will arrive at a place that we're doing really good things for students when it comes to the kinds of instructions that we're allowing, kind of instruction that we're, that we're exposing them to, and that, once again, would align itself with, with what, we, what is our hope and what the state's hope is to provide our students with strong education that is attached to uh, hands-on, collaborative learning that, that, is, that is connected outside of the classroom. If I might add, um, Mr. Pike and Dr. Cashwell, you know, one of the reasons why we're here today and we feel like, you know, um, the Freeman staff is ready for this move is the data that we showed on a previous slide where, you know, 87 and 88 percent of their staff members are comfortable with teaching on the block schedule. Um, had those numbers been different, maybe we're having a different conversation and we're, you know, back to the drawing board and, and trying to do things to get folks to be more comfortable. But because 
so many of their staff members have had experience teaching on the block schedule or feel a, a high level of comfort um, is one of the reasons why we're here today. Also, with respect to challenges, one of the challenges that I anticipate is, you know, some of the students, our, you know, seniors, 11th graders and 10th graders who are used to a seven period day. The challenge with that is if we make a change, it's going to impact students no matter what, because um, it's not like you can run a, you know, block schedule for some students and a seven period schedule for other students. So unfortunately, it will take some getting used to for some of our students, but we feel like the, the kids at Freeman and Godwin are, are resilient. Um, it won't take long for them to get used to a schedule because it is what they've experienced at the middle school level. And, you know, it, it'll take everyone sort of working together, you know, teachers, staff, parents, everyone. Um, but we, we stand ready to support Freeman and Godwin. Um, our principals have done a great job with professional development in terms of preparing teachers for a move next year because, you know, teaching practices will have to change with the additional time. But so far, the, the, the feedback has been great from their staff. So we really haven't had a lot of teachers, um, you know, indicate an intense level of fear like they might have in the beginning, you know, when the, the, the communication was made to the staffs about the potential of going to a block schedule. I really feel like, and just from my time in both buildings, there's a certain comfort level now. And I think teachers are ready to just know what the schedule is going to look like for next year so they can prepare. Are you going to follow up? Yeah, I just okay, wanted to. Yes. Go ahead. Um, he, he I, I'm sorry. No, um, go ahead. You know, I, I don't think I'm as worried about the 87% to say that they're comfortable. How about the other 13%? How, how are you going to bring those people along so that there's a level of comfort and competence? And the last thing anybody wants to see is that 90 minute block of time to be a waste for, for somebody that doesn't have a buy in. Uh, you know, I don't think any of you or any of us would want to walk in a classroom and see at the last 15 minutes people there twiddling their thumbs. So how, how do you, you know, that to me is really, really critical. How are you going to bring along that, that group that's just going to be resistant and not comfortable? Um, and I know you can wear people down, and, and, but that, that to me is a really critical piece. I, I think the other thing is, can you help me, help, help, help us help understand the timeline in terms of when you started having this discussion with your faculty and staffs. When were they, I mean, what was the, what was the timeline that you started having these conversations and started working towards this? If I could say, so we began the discussion back in November. We surveyed our staff and it was really a preliminary survey just to, again, um, uh, learn a little bit more about why it is we haven't ever moved to the block schedule and if we did what it would mean and and I can say that yeah the the the, the opinions differed on whether it was a good idea or whether, whether it wasn't but at the end of the day I think what was important for me the takeaway for me was Freeman High School's uh, um, staff and faculty's commitment to do the right thing for, for students and so regardless of what the response it centered on that that whole notion of what is right for our students if I could say, one of the, the amazing dynamics that I've seen, kind of an outworking as to all of this, is um, we've steadily moved to more of a collaborative model at our school. That has been mm. our mission. It's been certainly my mission since I've returned to Freeman. And I can say that within the course of the past year, and certainly within the past couple months, what we've seen is this move to block has brought our staff closer together because suddenly we're thinking about more collaboration, we're thinking about more content team work to support our students. And, and Mr. Pike, to the question, what about the 21%? It is my firm belief that, that as we continue this move to building collaboration, which is great for our kids across the board, I think the level of comfort with, with the way that we're seeing things move in our building, the, that 21% will find support and resource among their peers. One of the main things that um, I said, Mr. Pike, to my staff um, was, I vow to support you in whatever way you need. And I have had conversations with the folks who did not say that they were comfortable. And the reason that they're not comfortable is because they've never done it. But if they have opportunities to see someone else doing it through observing master teachers, and they're doing that right now, some went today to do that, 
um, and others are participating in group discussions about that. They're working with our innovative learning coaches on Tuesdays um, for the rest of the year. And folks had an opportunity and a choice in those trainings and what they could participate in and what they didn't need to participate in. So that's been a really powerful thing for our faculty is to look at what professional learning each person in our building needed. And um, you know, when, when we talk about um, ninth grade transition, the biggest thing that I hear from our parents coming to Godwin, and I have three open forums for ninth grade, rising ninth grade parents before they come to Godwin, um, where they can ask me questions. The biggest thing that I have heard in my three years as principal is why is Godwin on a different schedule than the rest of the county? So our families are questioning why. And it's been something that I have not really been able to answer until we kind of um, started doing the Henrico Learner Profile and looking at things a little differently and looking at how high school can be different for students. Um, and that is the right pathway for us to move into a schedule that gives us opportunities to do things that we haven't been doing before and look at opportunities for students that we haven't looked at before at Godwin. And um, I think that that's going to be really well received, especially with our transitioning students and with the rest of the students and families. We will work with them and I vow to be a support for them too because it's important to provide that support for folks when there is a change. So, thank you. Yes, Mrs. Um, just a couple of questions. Um, I, I echo some of the concerns that Mr. Pike has shared. I, the emails that I have received center around what seems to be a rush. If y'all started talking about it in November, you know, I'm sure that wasn't a community-wide discussion. And I think that's part of the problem is that um, some people feel like, well, wait a minute, I just heard about this a month or two ago and they're going to do it in September. One of the biggest concerns is with student schedules. I had one email from a parent that said, my, my kid's schedule is already set. They've already picked their classes and how that's going to be revisited with the students. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of, of block schedule and I think it's about time that y'all are doing this. I just want to be sure we're doing it the right way. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, there's this perception that the decision is coming from on high and this is being foisted upon you as something you have to do. So if this is coming from your faculty and from the, from the staff that this is what you think is best for the students, then, then okay, I, I'm all for that. I just want to be sure that's the way you feel, that this is coming from you in the best interest of the kids then, but that's not what I heard at first, to be honest with you. So if that's what you're telling us today, am, am I right? That you, this is coming from you, as opposed to us. Because that's the first email I got, is how could the board force Godwin and Freeman to do this? And I want to be sure that no one thinks that, because that's not what we're doing. But it is, I mean, you're shaking your head, they can't hear it if you don't say yes. Yeah, I, and so I've, um, I've entertained staff. I mean, there's a, gr there's a good number of staff in my building that are very excited about the fact that we're moving to Block. Right. Um, I have spoken to, I, in fact, I had a meeting with a parent earlier this week who said, uh, if, tell me if this is not happening because I would like to be at the next board meeting to go ahead and share my thoughts on it. Um, I, I have received emails. I received an email, I believe it was the day before from a parent, and I know these are individual parents, but I think that, that to, to the degree that we have some uh, response against it, I think there is also a good number of, of, of uh, community members and staff, for that matter, too, that are excited about the change mm -hmm. and what it will do for our students. So. Um, I would have to say that I think measuring both of those things would, would be important. Um, I, my general perception is that um, this is a phase like anything else that we'll go through where people are working through what does this mean, what will it look like. Um, Dr. Farrell has been kind enough to involve us in some meetings that looks at uh, what, the, speaking to our technology folks, looking at what the schedule would look like. And um, the impressions that we have is there are some things that will need to be, to be adjusted, but there's some exciting things that will happen on the other hand, too. So I think that, that by and large, there's my general perception is that given my community and my staff, there is, there is a, a degree of excitement about it. 
So in other words, um, I take from that, you are going to have to do some work with the students to adjust schedules. That's as soon as the decision is made, because they picked seven classes and they will have eight. So there has to be some adjustment. No, no ma'am, it'll be seven, seven classes still. Mm -hmm. how, does that, how does that work? Okay, so. You don't do four and four like most? <laughs> so that was my next question is what form of block are you going to do? Are you going to do a modified or that that's would and, be and interesting it, to know as well. And Mrs. Ogburn, if I might, before we get to that question, I want to make sure we fully address the comments that that you that were well stated in regard to I know that the school board, um, as well as in my role as superintendent, have heard from constituents um, related to whether this is a, a decision that's being thrust upon these schools or whether this is something that's um, been generated um, at the school level. And, and as I stated earlier, um, decisions related to the way schools function as far as their scheduling and, and how their complement is used uh, rest with the principals and so um, the principals have um, that's why I invited them to come forward today to share uh, the journey that they've had in coming to this decision that they've made for their buildings um, and certainly be able to communicate um, how they've gotten to that point and certainly allow the board to, to share any concerns and, and make sure that we're um, understanding fully the plan you have for your buildings going forward for support of not only the staff the students but also making things clear to the community and so I'll leave it now for you to address the scheduling piece and what will it mean for students I know you had a few slides on that but as far as courses they've selected next steps and any other pertinent information related to um, communication to parents the courses. so the, the sure. schedule that we're looking at uh, Ms. Ogburn is um, sort of a alternating block schedule mm -hmm. where for example first period would meet every day but then we would go um, periods two, four, six, okay. and then periods three, five, seven. Okay, so you're doing a modified. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And um, just to further um, discuss the point of this being a principal's decision, we are, very, we are a very tight-knit high school principal group. We're very collaborative, and we often have conversations um, at our monthly high school principal's meetings, and then my principals you know, finish up with more meetings without me being present. And they talk about these things, and they talk about wanting to be more unified across the county and to have more common practices from school to school. So this is truly something that, you know, these principals have talked about and wanted to bring to the table. This is not something that was, we were given no direction from the school board, no direction from Dr. Cashwell. This is truly coming from our principals. Well, and I think that's a, an important distinction to make for the community. Yes. Um, and so when... You know, I, I think it's important if the staff as a whole is supportive of this, that we communicate that to, to parents. This is what we think is in the best interest of the learning of your child. And because that's what we're in the business to do is to educate and that this is the best way to do it, then, then you know, I think we are all in. Um, the only question I have is, though, if you think it's ready are we ready for prime time? That, I mean, that's a change is hard. Yes. It, it, it always is, whether it's your students or your staff and, um, or the parents in the community. But I mean, obviously, all of our other high schools are doing just fine with Block and, um, and all of our middle schools. So I, I agree, it's time to do it. But I just want to be sure that you have the support that you need to get that done successfully. Um, like Mr. Pike said, where are the roadblocks? And we need to be sure that you don't hit those without the help that you need. So we believe we're ready. Okay. We believe we have the support nece necessary to move forward. One more. Yes, Mr. Huh. Pike. What's the timeline for truly communicating this? Mm -hmm. when, when are we going to, when are you truly <clears throat> going to tell your, your students, your faculty and your community? What's, what's the time frame for that? We'd like to begin communicating um, as soon as possible. So, um, you know, next week, we'd like to begin that communication to give folks an opportunity to um, share any concerns or ask questions about what this would look like moving forward. I think um, Mr. May indicated that, you know, one of the main questions that they've gotten from parents is, what does this look like for my kid? And the school counselors at Freeman and Godwin are ready to answer those questions and to, you know, really support students with their schedules for next year. 
as best as they can. Now, will you do that through written communication, or are you yeah. going to have a meeting at school, or what are you planning to do as far as how do you, it, how do you accomplish that? Mm -hmm. Freeman was planning on sending out a communication to the community to say that we'd be doing it and then um, opening it up to additional conversations with our counselors and administrators if that became necessary. Okay. Um, and I, at Godwin, the same thing. So I like to address uh, individual concerns of families because one student may not have the same concerns as another. And then, you know, if we talk about it as a group, then folks don't get the answers to their own needs. So my style would be to individualize that attention, um, you know, and I would hope that that would help to alleviate some of the um, concerns that families would have moving forward from Godwin. I do have one other question. Is this something that has to be approved or they, I, I don't think, I mean, I, no. I don't know. Yeah. No. no this is and I would just, you know, reiterate as far as the communication piece, I mean, I certainly hear you and I, I know the principals do and Dr. Farrell as well, that we um, can certainly provide for the board for your information subsequent to this meeting, a timeline regarding communication that will happen. <laughs> Um, beyond today, um, I believe in conversation with the principals in getting to this point um, while they stand ready to um, implement this change, they did want to offer the board an opportunity to offer comments, feedback, and questions um, before they communicated to their families. Should there be anything to consider? While it's not a board decision or vote, certainly they want to be cognizant <coughs> of the board's um, feelings related to the issue before they make that communication to their families. So they stand ready to do that after this evening, and we will provide a timeline to you. Thank you. Mr. Mrs. Cuff. Um, as our representative on the Career and Technical Education Business Council, I just wanted to, to say that, you know, I feel that there's been a lot of, or we feel that there's been a lot of roadblocks and havoc, ex, you know, for our students. And that taking the block schedule, having us all on the same schedule this time, it, it really will open up for equitable opportunities. And, and that's been something that's really caused us a lot of stress and our students that want to take programs in our ACE centers a lot of stress for a few years here. But with our, our I think you had mentioned it, you know, with the learner profile, with our pro, um, project based learning, you know, to really have these authentic learning experiences, the, the 90 minutes are going to be so much better. And I, I don't think it's going to be 15 minutes of twiddling thumbs. I think we're going to use every bit of that to give our students some authentic experiences. But um, I, I know that career and technical education, we're ecstatic about it, uh, of this opportunity. And so I just wanted to bring up that equity piece of having all of our students have that opportunity to be in our ACE Center programs. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, I have a couple, couple of, I think, short questions. So if the first period meets every day, what class will that, what subject will that be? It, it varies from school to school. So, so, I mean, will it, so some, so every student will have some class 92, five times 90 minutes a week? Is that how it's done? No, it, it would be an abbreviated period. So maybe like 55 minutes. And it wouldn't necessarily be every student. It would depend on your schedule. Um, but everybody's got a first period, though, right? If, if you're required to have a first period, um, maybe your classes that you need to take are offered periods two, four, and six, or, you know, three, five, and seven. Right. So it, it all depends on your individual schedule. So, well, I just, so if, if, I, if I had, let's say I had a student in the, fir, in the 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th grade, I would, first of all, I'd be losing my mind. <laughs> but let's say I had one. So they had, the, every day they show up for first period right yes and they have some first something to do during that time yes if they and don't have do that whatever it is they're doing on monday they're going to do it on tuesday wednesday thursday and friday right so if let's just say for example it one's in math one's in english one's in science and one's in pe so that my, my kid will get five my student will get five periods of pe and his colleague will get or his brother or sister will get Two or three is that? I, I, maybe I just don't understand the modified block application. Um, that would be accurate. Uh, one student would have PE five times a week, and the other. Go ahead. I'll yeah. make sure. Okay. It, it's all about the time. Right. So yes, 
five times a week for the one student, and the other student would either have it two times a week or three times right. a week. Right, depending on how it falls. Yes, depending on how it falls. But what this would do is, you know, to, to Ms. Cox's point, it would give our ACE students an opportunity to spend an entire day at the ACE Center I, as opposed to, right. you know, no, traveling. I, agree, I understand that. I just didn't, I didn't realize that, that it, so example, if, if I have a student who's strong in math, but weak in English, but his first period's math, he's going to get five days of math in two or three days of English when he really needs, I mean, how do, is that something that we have, that even and figures in? Can I, can I take sure. this? Sure. Yes, please. Um, that, that is one of the things that, it, that gives you the opportunity to really customize the needs of students. So if you have a student who maybe would benefit from math five days a week, you can, you, you work to try to build their schedule around that first period math class. Okay. If you have a, a student that, you know, maybe, bless, bless you, that has a, a weakness in the language arts, then you might look and say, can we fit them into a, a first period English class? Um, you know, but every student will have seven classes. It's just a matter of when they meet. No different than if they're stacked back to back, one through seven, it's a matter of how the time is split. And by having that first period to be an everyday and shorter period. Uh, that's part of, I thought, so the first period is a short, is a, how long? They, roughly somewhere between around 55 minutes. Okay. Right. And so what happens is the that's time just, sort of averages out. And also you do your announcements during that first period. Okay. So the okay. additional time that's there is used for some of the housekeeping that happens daily already. That first period is not a 90 minute period. Okay. No, it is that, not so. That really was, a, I didn't ask my question very well. Um, and then a couple of, let's see here. And then let me ask you this. We had the two slides talking about the, the teachers that were somewhat are comfortable or very comfortable and also who have done it before. Did, is, was there a question about a preference? I'm just curious because a lot of feedback we got, I think, was from a preference standpoint. Nobody ever said I'm uncomfortable or I can't do it. They just said I preferred that. And I'm just wondering if, if that question was asked. So that just as sort of a, of a baseline. Um, we did not ask the preference question, but I can tell you then when, that when we communicated it to our staffs uh -huh. that um, half the room cheered uh -huh. and half the room Bold. a little, well, not half, but, you know, the percentage of folks that you see up here, it, you know, it was pretty true to where, um, where things lied with people's uh, emotions, so. Yeah. Feedback I got was probably closer to half and half, but I think that was yeah. preference versus somebody who was comfortable or uncomfortable or able or unable. And then the last thing I'd say is this, and this is more a statement thing. It's the reason, I believe the reason we're having this discussion now, not because we need to vote on it or anything else, is because two things. One is initially, the first time that I knew we were doing it, it was conveyed that this was a decision of the board. And so that's why we said, no, it's not. And we need to understand, you know, what, therefore, we, we need to understand what's going on. We understand now. Thank you for providing it. And then the other thing was we got a lot of feedback from the public. And normally, ordinarily, decisions in the building, we don't get a lot of feedback. We get some. You know, why are middle school students not allowed to carry backpacks now? Why are there's some. There's always some with that. This was uh, this was um, of a much higher volume, and so that's that's the only reason that we're here today. We're not trying to make the decision for you or really to second guess it, but uh, we're here because of those two things. And initially, it was it was it was indicated that it came from us which is not as we just said is not our role and was not the case and then secondly we got a lot of feedback from the public so y'all have done a, a, a i believe and i can speak from the board that that you've done a lot gone a long ways towards answering those two or addressing those two points is there anything else from any other board member can I, uh, one more yes, okay. yes please Mr. can you um i i can be comfortable going to a block schedule okay <laughs> <clears throat> but am I getting the support? I don't care if I'm comfortable in between or last. Are you getting the support you need from staff development? Are you, are, are, is that in place? Because if, if that's not in place, I can say I'm comfortable, but am, am I getting the support that I need to be able to be successful in the classroom in making this transition, not only for myself as a professional, but also 
desiring to be at my best as a professional for the students that I'm going to be interacting with. So, you know, it's, it's great to say that I'm comfortable, but am I getting the support that I need to be able to be successful and for my students to be successful? I feel very supported uh, by our central office staff in our building, um, including support from Dr. Farrell um, and giving us school-related leave for our teachers to attend um, you know, these classrooms where they're already on block schedule um, and the, prof the professional learning and leadership department has already jumped in and led sessions for our teachers before and after school. Um, we, are, we are very supported. I always feel very supported by central office staff, but I think it will, um, as we move into more of those supports that are gonna happen throughout May, um, our teachers will see that support too, and they've already expressed to me that the sessions have been powerful and have given them um, opportunities to learn something new. So I, I look forward to more of that. Um, and in our transition plan uh, with the support that we presented today, that will go all the way up through next year, um, starting in September with our faculty meetings and professional learning opportunities for our teachers. So. If I could offer to, I, I'm, I'm very excited because we do. We, we are getting a lot of support. We've. Um, I personally have come to Dr. Farrell for um, specific needs, and he's, be, he's been very, very um, amenable to giving us whatever support we need. I have to, if I could say that, uh, again, we do, have st we do have faculty that are somewhat concerned, um, and we've already started to do some things. We do a last Friday morning session uh, where our staff volunteer to come in early and to be a part of um, uh, staff development that is, by the way, uh, teacher run, and administrators not running it. And the numbers of the folks that are showing up is so encouraging. There's that and various other things. And for me, there is a sense of excitement because what I'm seeing here, especially at Freeman High School, and, and we do get the notion that we're one of the oldest schools and you know we do have our ways, but I, I'm seeing some, some very, very wonderful things happen when it comes to the dynamic, the velocity between staff, the excitement. Uh, it's, it's very re-energizing, and, and it is my hope that that will carry itself through into the coming year. And, and where there are staff that feel that, you know, it is, this is a large challenge, maybe larger than they can manage, I'm confident that given what is happening in the building, that we'll be able to support those, those individuals adequately. Very good. Thank you. Anything else? Well, good. That was a very thorough explanation and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Thank you. Super, did I do that too often? Thank you to our presenters. Good luck. <laughs> yes. And just to, to reiterate to the board, as a follow-up to today's presentation, we will provide you the communications plan that each high school will use going forward with their communities just so you can be in the loop. Thank so you. I'll get that to you. All right, for the next item, the superintendent recommends that the school board accept the grant funding from No Kid Hungry, share our strength in the amount of $10,372. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. There's a motion to accept the No Kid Hungry Share Our Strength grant. So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper, seconded by Mrs. Ogburn. All those favor indicate by saying aye. aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. The superintendent recommends that the school board accept the Virginia Department of Education's Career and Technical Education Competitive Innovative program equipment for high demand and fast growth industry sectors grant award of $37,500 to the Center for Engineering at Highland Springs High School. Thank you. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding this grant. Is there a motion to accept the superintendent's recommendation to accept the grant? So moved. It's been moved by Mr. Pike. Is there a second? Second. Been seconded by Reverend Cooper. All those in favor of the Cape of saying aye. aye. Any opposed? The grant is accepted. And I believe I uh, may have gone out of order and I apologize. <laughs> That's okay. Having skipped the IDEA um, grant award. So for those following along with the agenda, I want to make sure that I do not miss that one. I apologize. Uh, I'm so sorry. That's five, three. <laughs> 5.03. Okay, I wanted to make sure I had the amounts correctly, so I did not misread. The superintendent recommends that the school board approve the consideration for the U.S. Department of Education IDEA Part B Parent Resource Center Grant Awards um, 
for three staff persons, or I'm sorry, for two summer staff persons, $15,000, and for a school-based education team um, and welcome kits in the amount of $4,000. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation regarding the grant from U.S. Department of Education, IDEA Part B Parent Resource Center Grant Award. Is there a motion to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. Moved by Mrs. Ogburn. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. Next, the superintendent recommends that the school board accept the grant award from the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund Advisory Committee in the amount of $3,506. Members of the board, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation that we accept the grant from the Chesapeake Bay Restoration Fund Advisory Committee. Is there a motion to adopt the superintendent's recommendation? So moved. So moved by Reverend Cooper, seconded by Mr. Pike. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed, ayes have it. The motion carries. <clears throat> Thank you. And for the next item under instruction, um, staff will be providing an update on STEAM at the elementary school level. You'll recall at the last meeting we had an update on STEAM at the middle school level. And so for our presentation, um, we're joined by a number of staff. Dr. Tigan and Dr. Hughes will kick it off. And we're also joined by principals Mike DeSalt and Ryan Stein this evening. So welcome. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Montgomery, members of the board, Dr. Cashwell. My name is Leslie Hughes, and I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Instruction. And as Dr. Cashwell said, joining me this evening are Deputy Superintendent Beth Tigan and two of our esteemed principals, Ryan Stein of Greenwood Elementary and Mike, St oh, excuse me, Ryan Stein and Mike DeSalt of Trin Hickory Elementary. Together, we will present the board a work session titled the Elementary STEAM Update. To begin, let's take a moment to revisit the Henrico County Public Schools mission statement, which articulates our ultimate goal, to engage students in a diverse educational, social, and civic learning experiences that inspire and empower our students to become contributing citizens. How is this mission accomplished? The common vision for student outcomes and deeper learning experiences live within the Henrico Learner Profile, which you heard about a little earlier this, evening, this afternoon. As a reminder, the Henrico Learning Profile encompasses the work around the six C's and the four pillars of deeper learning and provides focus to ensure students are provided rich academic experiences and are prepared to be life ready. As the board is aware, Dr. Cashwell's entry plan and post entry plan are summarized in Amy's passport that highlights Dr. Cashwell's travels, reflections, and next steps for Henrico County Public Schools. As a reminder, these reflections were based on intensive internal and external stakeholder feedback as Dr. Cashwell packed her bags and traveled from school to school and engaged in community experiences. One next step that was outlined in the passport was to closely re-examine the structure of the current STEAM teacher positions at elementary and to develop a model to provide quality lessons infused in design thinking across the core curriculum versus a standalone isolated course. As Dr. Cashwell's next steps were presented, central staff began to revisit the STEAM concept and considered the following recommendations. To re-examine the structure of STEAM teachers in elementary to expand STEAM and innovation. To infuse the design thinking process and inquiry throughout the elementary curriculum to provide embedded and ongoing instructional coaching aligned to the Henrico Learner Profile and Deeper Learning Model, and finally to shift all libraries to a flexible schedule in the 2021 school year to allow for deeper learning and STEAM integration using a Learning Commons model. In support of these outcomes, a committee of elementary principals and leaders explored elementary structures. This committee examined daily planning time for teachers, discuss the expansion of STEAM, and propose an instructional coaching model to build teacher capacity. At this time, I'll turn the presentation over to Mike DeSalt and Ryan Zine to further discuss their experiences. Good afternoon. As many of you may or may not know, um, the history of planning at the elementary level is a one where um, we looked at a 30-minute block of time about four days a week. Um, so, and if you had a kindergarten classroom walking them, that's obviously not going to be 30 minutes by the time you get there. So, 
having the ability as we look towards the 2019-20 year to have consistent everyday planning for 40 minutes and to not only have 40 minutes of planning time, but to have that time with an entire grade level uh, is a huge accomplishment uh, for the elementary folks. And it's a game changer uh, for secondary down the road because we're now getting the ability to extend um, the deeper learning model in various ways and we'll see the benefits in the years to come. If we look back at the STEAM standalone for this year, um, obviously, Integration in a classroom is a great idea, but when it can be pushed out, it's even better. If you think back 10 years ago, many of us had computer labs in our classrooms, and we found out that we had a greater impact when we pushed those into the classrooms. Uh, a number of us about five years ago really got on board with children's engineering and STEM, and we realized that once teachers got the hang of it and they had the supports and coaching that they needed, we could do it much more effectively in the classroom. So we're following that same model. So now, with the ability of having instructional learning coaches join our common planning, uh, the sky's really the limit for where we can take this. So what does this look like? And uh, when we went down to, uh, uh, to visit some schools, that was the, the number one thing that I really want to see is what does this common planning model look like? And I was blown away um, to see an entire grade level sitting together during the day versus after school where you have to teach all day or after you have to take a group of kindergarten students to the zoo and, uh, and then you have to plan after that uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but seeing a whole grade level together, being able to see an administrator part of that common planning meeting to really get to know the students and really dive into the data but the biggest piece was the instructional coach and the instructional conversations that were taking place during these common planning meetings, during our observations. Being able to hear an instructional coach say, um, you know, what STEAM activities could be added to a small group reading lesson or what uh, ways can we combine a science and a math lesson and integrate it for the whole week versus just a one lesson. Uh, so now, as principals, we're looking at our master schedules and trying to figure out, um, you know, how we can implement this common planning at our schools. And, and I can tell you that we are very excited about truly taking the next step uh, of creating all these deeper learning activities aligned with the Henrico Learner Profile and ultimately creating life-ready kids. And so thank you. And so part of being able to provide this daily planning time, we have had to add additional complement um, to support it. And so our elementary teachers will see that there will be additional art and music teachers um, that were added as well as a librarian. And full-time paraprofessionals were added to extend health and PE as well as to help some of our large, and both of these, let me be clear, the, instruct the paraprofessionals for health and PE, as well as some extending paraprofessionals at some of our libraries, was really to help with the, um, the number of students at some of our schools that have a large number of sections of classes. And so we looked at a differentiated model to be able to help them, while also looking at ways that we could extend um, health and PE time, as well as some additional time um, in the art, library, and music segments. And so we also needed to look ooh, at, sorry, didn't realize it was phased in. It's not on my computer. But anyway, so we, we really wanted to look at, as we started to think about this transition to the daily planning and looking at taking the STEAM teacher out of an encore rotation, and putting the STEAM into the, every classroom in the elementary schools. We looked at the, the job description for the STEAM position as well as the job description for our coaches, which are um, innovative learning coaches. And you, we did a crosswalk, and you have a folder that has, and it's posted on the website, that shows a crosswalk of those two positions. And then what we did is we created a new job description 
well, that still call, you know, still called an innovative learning coach, but that can really support not only the planning, the instructional planning piece that Mr. Stein was speaking about, but also that infusing of STEAM. And you will see on the job description what's been highlighted in yellow shows how much STEAM has been embedded into the expectations of this role. And so as, as we look moving forward in 2019-2020, um, we currently have 12 innovative learning coaches for the elementary schools. And I know when we talk about secondary level and we talk, you just heard about the roles that those positions will play, you know, moving when you change scheduling within a school or programming within a school. We currently have 12 coaches over 46 schools, meaning that most of our schools only see an innovation learning coach one day a week at the elementary level. Um, we have 16 STEAM positions. Out of those 16 STEAM positions, five of them feel that they're ready to move into the innovative learning coach role, and their principals agree. They've had some flexibility within their schedule this last year, and they did some of that push-in into the grade level planning. They did some modeling for teachers, and we've seen, you know, and so we have five of them that have said, I'd like to be an innovative learning coach next year. And then we've added innovative learning coaching positions to bring us up to 32 total to help with moving into those, to help move that instruction to deeper learning. And then in 20, 20, 2021, the last 11 STEAM teacher positions would be converted to innovative learning coach positions. And I think it's important to realize that every one of the, both positions, whether it was a STEAM position or an innovative learning coach position, what they have been doing will be different in that coaching mo model that the principals were just talking about, about really being that instructional coach and being able to be a part of working with teachers, whether it's in common planning, whether it's in modeling, whether it's in individual conversations or, after, or professional development that's provided for the staff. It's a different role than they currently have. If you're in a school one day a week as an innovative learning coach, you're not doing that same thing. And so we have planned professional development opportunities that will be that all of the positions, whether it's an innovative learning coach or a STEAM teacher that's converting or a STEAM teacher that's staying in a STEAM position. Because if there are STEAM teachers that weren't comfortable transitioning or their, or their principals in that collaboration didn't feel they were ready, we wanted to give them a year so that they could have embedded ongoing professional development so that they can be hopefully prepared and say that they want to take on that role. They certainly don't have to, but we, we want to make sure that they understand what adult learning theory is. I mean, right now, a STEAM Encore teacher is working with students, and an innovative learning coach, while they work with students some, is really working with adults. Um, we also are going to transition, while the STEAM teachers are transitioning, the ones that stay STEAM will continue to report to their principals. So their principals are gonna be their supervisor and they'll evaluate them. And they have support from central office staff in doing that. Um, for the elementary innovative learning coaches, they're also going to be um, having their supervision and evaluation coming from their principal, but that'll be in collaboration with central office staff. And so we want to support, because it's, a new, it's new for the principals, too, to be evaluators of an innovative learning coach and, and being in this model. And so we, we have planned a lot of support that's ongoing next year um, through each of our monthly meetings that we um, have planned. We have shared some non-negotiables like the roles and responsibilities of the innovative learning coaches in the building, the ability for us to pull out staff for professional development so that we can provide that so we're, we're using a consistent model of training, consistent model of coaching, the same coaching model we've used for any other coach that we have within the division. And then we also know that some of the innovative learning coaches that are currently in that role are on extended contracts. 
And so our principals know that extended contract time belongs to the central office so that we can use them to provide professional development um, throughout the summer for on a division-wide level. Do you, do you know how many are on the extended contract? Um, I'm talking at the elementary level, how many? How, no, no, how, there are 12. How many are on 11 months? All 12. All 12. I'm okay. sorry, how many are on 13, I'm on the uh, 12 months? Three. Three. Okay. We have three that are on 12 months, okay. and, and then the others are all on 11 months. But all of the new positions are 10 month teacher contracts. Okay. And we feel that's appropriate for what we need, but we will use the extra con contract time to provide, you know, I don't, you've probably heard of like Techapalooza and some of our right. summer training that we do and that they'll be responsible for providing that for the okay. whole county. Thank you. You're welcome. And so during, during the year next year, as I shared, there will be, even before the professional development that we'll be doing all year next year, we do have some trainings planned for this summer. We're really trying to offer a variety um, whether it be face-to-face, -face, whether it be online, we're trying to model the anytime, anywhere and allowing our staff to um, kind of personalize their learning. And be happy to answer any questions. Members of the board, are there questions? You did, Mrs. Ogden. Um, surprise. Um, a typical work week for an elementary school teacher. So are they going to have, what's going to be that fifth? Is there going to be a fifth thing that they have? Yes. So what the, is that going to be? And, and it depends on the number. It's very complicated, but we have like four different models that it depends on the number of sections that a school has of classes. Okay, and the grade level, I would assume. Right. And so if they, you know, that, that they have one of the options is that they use the Monday as a wheel day. Mm -hmm so that while they have a consistent Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday schedule, that on Mondays it's a repeat day, so students will be getting additional encore time. And that'll rotate based on which week of the month. And Mondays were selected because we have four early release Mondays in the fall, and so we wanted to honor the full you know, class time during the non-early release days, and that would give us some variety. Which is a consistent problem for elementary school teachers, so thank you for paying attention to that. And the possibility of having 40 minutes of dedicated planning time and to have common planning time, this is like nirvana for elementary school teachers. I mean, I just can't imagine. Um, it's been a thing that I've always heard about as an elementary school teacher. So I don't know if other counties are doing this, but if not, they should be. They're, we're leading the way. So from, from that perspective, I'm proud of what we're doing. I really am. I'm excited. And the teachers, I mean, the ones I'm hearing from are so excited about the possibility of this coming to fruition. Now, do we know yet which are going to be the 32 that have this in the fall and the remaining the next year, have those schools been informed yet? Or yes, they, they, they were informed last week. Okay. And um, I will also state that our st schools that are staying as STEAM schools mm -hmm. will receive that one day of support throughout this year as well. Right. And we're going to use our current ILCs to do that because they have been doing that. And we've tried to be purposeful in pairing mm -hmm. so that we have where there have been relationships previously. Right. I'm excited. I think this is great. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, Mr. Pike. I think I heard Mr. Stein say that he had visited a school where the, the training, the 40 minutes was in play. Where, where was that? What school system? We went down to Virginia Beach. Virginia Beach. Okay. And um, in terms of... Um, we could, when we, honestly, we could have gone across the river to Chesterfield. <laughs> Well, you know, it was probably a prettier day, so that's why you went to Virginia Beach. So, uh, it was a nice day. Uh, that's good. That's good. Uh, how about finding these people, these teachers? I mean, are we, are we going to be able to staff these positions and find these? I know that, you know, you can walk across the aisle and become one, but... At, at, and that's a great question, and they have been posted, and 
we do have applicants and we've wor we're really working on the, the timeline so that we're sure that if we take some of our own um, staff from schools that we still have um, some of the open period where we can take staff from other school divisions quite honestly and so, we're, so good uh, we're being feeling. we're being resourceful but you know we're going through the same process that we've always gone through for for ILCs from the standpoint of the interviews will look the same but we're going to do a screening at the central office level and we're going to give principals a, a pool of candidates that we feel have the qualities and characteristics that they're going to need to have to do this work because not all of them I mean we're lucky we have two principals here that went with us that have been ITRTs, but not all principals have had that experience to understand the role. And so we'll send those candidates out, but we have more candidates than we have opportunities for them to walk into these roles. It's kind of exciting. One, one quick question. What, it, what, does, what training does a teacher need to have to convert, let's say from the classroom to an ILC? Or degree or what I mean what I think a big for? part of the transition is is that understanding adult theory and how you work with adults in coaching them through and the coach and the training for coaching um, that's been a big emphasis last year where the ITRTs have used a consistent coaching model the other coaches in the across the division have not and we've really worked hard to to go back and say, this is our coaching model, and every coach is being trained in that so that when we're in schools, it doesn't matter whether you're an innovative learning coach, whether you're a math coach, a reading coach, um, a principal coach, let's be talking the same language so that we're on that same page and understanding how we help people change practice. It's about change theory, too. If I might add yeah. to that, I think to your question, was there a prerequisite degree or endorsement that the individual needed? And, and that is not the case other than being um, licensed to be a teacher. Yes, ma'am. And so some of that coaching professional development would be provided to individuals who shift into that role if that's something they weren't coming into the role with. Mm -hmm. So teachers with uh, a strong desire to work in a coaching role and having that um, strong instructional background would be considered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. So our next item is uh, yes. Uh, yes, next item would be a review <coughs> of the 2019-2020 fee schedule for secondary and career and technical education students. And Debbie Hargrove, welcome back. And she Thank will you. provide a review for us. Okay. Um, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, and Dr. Cashwell. I believe you were sent the um, fee schedule for review um, oh, do I need to thank you <clears throat> on last Friday in your board update and I just didn't know if you all had any questions I will try to answer those um, I will tell you the major changes that I see um, the biggest of course is the reduction of the laptop fee from $50 to um, 25 and that was approved in our budget document a few hours about an hour ago and um, the only other one is really the dual enrollment Let me down. Can y'all do that? Okay. The dual enrollment course fee, um, which is going to be effective, it was approved by you all last year, and then I believe we, we tabled that, but we left it approved, and so it's just going to be, I guess, a reapproval, or it will now take effect in the fall of 2019. Um, it's for all dual enrollment courses, and all of the students that... Time out. Oh. I was going to say... Wrong it's not for all of the dual enrollment students. As you recall, in the fall, we um, had a discussion about the ACA centers. Right. I was getting and to that. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, this fee is for the non-ACA centers. It, the ACA centers this year's ninth graders will age up into the fee. <laughs> so the dual enrollment fee will be for um, all dual enrollment courses and for the students entering the ACE program in September of 19. <laughs> so they will not be paying the fee until their junior year. Correct. Correct? Correct. Okay. Um, other than that, do you all have any other questions? I'll try to answer. I'm sure I'll be calling up Mac. <laughs> yes, Mrs. Ogbert. I do. Um, just because this is still a thing and it's going to be confusing to some parents if we could 
put that part about the fees starting for the ACA in bold. But okay. also, what I I wondered if it's anywhere in the information that we give parents. Yes, ma'am. How many classes the ACA Center students take, and what is the total? Right. So that it's, if it's not on the fee schedule, because this was right. the complaint that oh yeah, fifty dollars, but the total right. wasn't listed as the fee, so they didn't understand. Yes, ma'am. So is it in the program? It's in the guide, and I can read that to you. I don't know if we can we can get you a copy of it, but it has um, on the, the ACA pages when students select that they want to go into that program at the bottom, it will say the 11th grade. It says each dual enrollment class will have a $50 fee. The 11th grade is 11 classes, $50 a fee per class, $550 a student. 12th grade, eight classes, $50 a class, 400 per student. So the total cost of the two-year program is $950. The, there was some talk when we had this discussion last time of getting parents to take that information and sign. They yes, did. I yes, ma'am. So we're doing that It was good. part Thank of you. the application process yes. when they, <laughs> okay. yes, ma'am. Because they, you know, not everybody reads the planning guide or yes, this sheet. Know. If there's somewhere <laughs> that they... That's great, thank you. Okay. And we'll Solving make sh a problem. sure that language, if you look at line at, at number 16 and 15. 17, that clearly states that fee applies to students entering the program in the fall of 2019. Right. So that language will stay there until um, they've everyone has aged into right. that. Well, and, and as long as they it. understand the total, then I think we're in a good place and we've yes. made a change that we needed to make. So yes, ma'am. Great. great, thank you very much. Thank you. Anything else? Good. Thank you for Thank sharing. You. Thank, yep. you. Thank you. And fine, uh, for the final item is a request that the school board award construction contracts for HVAC renovations to Warwick Plumbing and Heating Incorporated in the amount of $47,400 at Hermitage High School and in the amount of $175,400 at Wilder Middle School. And Susan is here to provide any information or answer questions should you have them related to these contracts. You have a question? Yes, please, Mrs. Cobb. <coughs> Hi, Ms. Moore. Is that um, have to do with the band room, or what part of it is the? At effect? Hermitage, it's mm -hmm. the boiler that serves the greenhouse, the, okay. the CTE building greenhouse. Okay. And at Wilder, it's the cooling tower that's being replaced. Thank you. That it? Mm -hmm. All right, great. Thank you. Any other questions? Then uh, a motion would be appropriate to adopt the superintendent's recommendation regarding the award of these two construction contracts. So moved. Moved by Reverend Cooper. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mrs. Cock. All in favor indicate by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that concludes items from the superintendent. Is there any unfinished business, board members? Any new business? I, I oh, I'm begging your pardon. That's okay. Too fast. Yes, I know, please, I, Mrs. Cox. I'm always concerned which one goes where. I just wanted to bring up our uh, CTE signing day uh, 2.0. That was held on April 23rd. Um, it was at Libby Mill um, in the Junior Achievement Finance Park. So if you see them out there, please thank them for hosting us and having us out there all day long because 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., Students were signing up with employers. Their parents were there taking pictures. And it was 102 students that will be graduating in June and will have a job after graduation. That's awesome. That's awesome. awesome. So, awesome. Very awesome. Well done. Mac, our director of CTE and your staff, you went above and beyond. Although I have to say I've heard from a little bird, a big bird, that uh, you're already working on signing day 3.0 for next year so we're excited about that but we commend you for your work and it was a pleasure to be there um, during the day and dr cashwell gave greetings and uh reverend Co cooper was there as well because he had a relative that got signed my niece that. did mm -hmm. yeah. very good thank you for sharing that yes, and reminding us of that is there anything else that anyone would like to add or provide all right that being the case our upcoming meeting date our next meeting will be may 23rd we're set to begin at 2 o'clock for the work session, the 6.30 monthly meeting. It will be here at Newbridge Auditorium. The meeting times may be adjusted, particularly for the work session, as necessary. There will be 